Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Over the next couple of episodes, I'd like to talk about Mike Love's late 70s side project, Celebration, concentrating on their self-titled album, which was released in 1979. In some respects, this album is sort of a Beach Boys garage sale of unused ideas and songs from the MIU period. If leftovers from MIU don't exactly sound like a lost treasure trove, you're probably right. There's a little more to it than that, and it's an odd, interesting, if very minor and poorly documented part of Beach Boy history. Let's begin with looking at the history of the Celebration Project itself so far as I've been able to determine. There seem to be a number of origin stories for Celebration. I think all of them are probably right. It didn't happen for one reason or all at once. The main driver behind Celebration, Mike Love, in his 2016 autobiography, devotes exactly two sentences to the project. In the late 1970s, seeking to work with performers who preferred meditation to drugs, I formed a band called Celebration. It featured guys who also played for the Beach Boys, including Ron Altbach, who was a superb concert pianist, and Charles Lloyd, the jazz saxophone and flute player. We talked about Charles Lloyd and his connection to the Beach Boys back in episode 79. More about Ron Altbach will follow. If there's a genesis to the story, it might have come in 1977. With relations within the Beach Boys at a low ebb, Mike calls this period the fracturing in his book, Mike, Ron Altbach, and Charles Lloyd put together a band to tour with other transcendental meditation enthusiasts, magician Doug Henning, and according to Altbach, comedian Andy Kaufman. Their aim is to raise money for the creation of Age of Enlightenment TM centers. Mike calls the band Waves, and they're joined on the road by Ed Carter, Gary Griffin, Mike Kowalski, Rusty Ford, and Ernie Rodriguez. Alan Jardine also appeared with them. Waves, along with Henning and Kaufman, play at least five shows on four dates in California, plus one in Texas, between October 17th and October 23rd, 1977. It was billed as Illusion or Reality, a magical musical experience. This would have been during or just before the sessions at Maharishi International University for the unreleased Merry Christmas from the Beach Boys and what became the MIU album. Mike liked the name Waves, according to Altbach, because it reminded him of Wings. He said that someday they could tour together as Wings and Waves, or as I'm sure Mike put it, waves and wings. Apparently somebody else out there also liked the name Waves. They discovered that the name was already in use by another band and therefore unavailable. Meanwhile, as discussed in episode 134, somewhere around this time Brian had been approached about providing songs for the teen movie Almost Summer. With the soundtrack on MCA and the group signed to CBS, the music could not be credited to the Beach Boys. According to comments Mike made on American Bandstand in 1978, this was the reason for forming Celebration, which included Altbach, Lloyd, Ed Carter, Gary Griffin, and Mike Kowalski, who had just been part of the Waves Project, plus Dave Doc Robinson and Wells Kelly. Like Altbach, Robinson and Kelly were former members of King Harvest, who had a number 13 hit with Dancing in the Moonlight in 1973. Wells Kelly was also drummer, keyboardist, and vocalist of Orleans. Wells is the second nude guy on the right of Orleans' 1976 hit album Waking and Dreaming. We could probably do an entire segment on whether that's the best or worst place to stand to have that picture taken, but that would be for a different channel. As talked about extensively in episode 134, the group put together the Almost Summer film soundtrack, which features three songs written or co-written and sung by Mike Love, plus incidental music by Ron Altbach and Charles Lloyd. The title track, Almost Summer, written by Brian Wilson, Mike Love, and Al Jardine, and credited to Celebration featuring Mike Love, was released as a single A-side on April 3rd, 1978. Also as discussed in episode 134, Celebration made their American Bandstand appearance on Saturday, May 6th, 1978, to promote the Almost Summer soundtrack album, miming to the title track single and to the track Cruisin'. Brian appeared with the group on Bandstand and seemed to be having a great time. The Almost Summer single peaked at number 28 on June 24th, 
which was not a bad showing at all. The Almost Summer soundtrack was released on May 8th. The credits are a little wonky. The back cover credits the first three songs, all of which have a Mike Love lead vocal and writing or co-writing credit as sung by Celebration. There are four instrumentals from the film written and played by other members of Celebration, and two cover songs, including the Beach Boys' It's Okay, played by members of Celebration and featuring a lead vocal from Dave Robinson. None of these tracks are actually credited to Celebration on the soundtrack album. Not even Ron Altbach's instrumental, Lookin' Good, which is credited to Celebration featuring Charles Lloyd on the B-side of the Almost Summer single. Possibly even weirder, and still unexplained as far as I know, when the Almost Summer film was finally released on September 22, 1978, nearly six months after the release of the soundtrack album, Celebration's name didn't appear anywhere in the credits. Instead, the music was shown as Performed by Taranga. From mid-April to early June, Celebration played a number of free concerts to promote Almost Summer. According to the Beach Boys in Concert book, their live debut came on April 15th outside Peaches Records in Dallas, Texas. Their second gig came almost two weeks later, on Friday, April 28th, when they played their most well-remembered and best documented show outside the Alpha Chi Omega Fraternity House at USC in LA with special guests Brian Wilson and Carl Wilson and Jan and Dean. To put a little context around this, on the day of the USC show, the Almost Summer single had been out for just over three weeks. It would enter the Billboard Hot 100 at number 177 on the chart published the next day, Saturday, April 29th. Celebration's bandstand appearance would come a week after that on Saturday, May 6th, and the Almost Summer soundtrack album would be released two days after that on Monday, May 8th. The most recently released Beach Boys album was still Beach Boys Love You, which had come out just over a year earlier. In comments on episode 134, Almost Summer Part 2, we heard from Ken Alvis, who was actually there at that USC show. He told us, What was notable for me was Carl performed with the group. It was very informal, and I remember Brian chatting with a number of students. Yes, it was a big-time party atmosphere because the concert was at Fraternity Row on 28th Street. The stage was set up right on the street. The other detail was Carl's involvement. He was in the background with Ed, that would be guitarist Ed Talea, and stayed there throughout the concert. Again, all the guys milled around chatting with everyone before and after the concert. It must have been a great day, and I really appreciated getting a first-hand account. Thanks for that, Ken. From what I've been able to glean elsewhere, including a couple of articles about the day helpfully reproduced on the Celebration album cover, it seems the event was attended by over 1,500 people, including a lot of press. Wolfman Jack introduced the band, who opened with Almost Summer, Cruisin', It's Okay, sung by Dave Robinson, and kind of surprisingly given the party atmosphere of the day, Sad Sad Summer, all from the soundtrack album. Additionally, during the course of the show, they performed Summer in the City, and Charles Lloyd's instrumental Island Girl, also from that Almost Summer soundtrack. They also did, over the course of the show, at least four of the ten tracks that would make up the Celebration album ten months later, and a jazz instrumental version of California Girls featuring Charles Lloyd on saxophone, kind of similar to the one that would eventually appear on Disco Celebration. Mike also sang the cover Everything I Touch Turns to Tears, which he recorded around this time for his unreleased solo album Country Love. Not surprisingly, in addition to promoting Almost Summer, Mike made pitches about the benefits of transcendental meditation. Dean Torrance joined the band on stage for Surf City, Little Old Lady from Pasadena, and a lyrical mashup of Catch a Wave and Sidewalk Surfing. Jan Barry added backing vocals and later returned to perform Barbara Ann with Dean. Both newspaper articles on the Celebration cover mentioned that Jan's voice sounded as good as ever. As you might expect, they performed a lot of Beach Boy hits in the later part of this two-hour show. Brian joined them on keyboards halfway through. Carl came on a little bit later. Brian later switched over to bass for Good Vibrations and Help Me Rhonda. You can find an audience recording of parts of this show on Alora's great YouTube channel. You might want to check that out. It seems a great time was had by everybody, particularly Brian, who one of the newspaper articles says was dancing, grinning, singing, and enjoying himself more on stage than he has in several years. I don't know the timing of when they recorded their bandstand appearance, but I wonder if Brian signed on for it because he enjoyed this performance so much. In addition to Celebration's free concerts, 
The Beach Boys introduced soundtrack songs Almost Summer and Cruise and into their live set list that spring, and Universal sent the film stars Lee Purcell and Tim Matheson out with the Beach Boys on a 10-day tour of the Southwest in April. All the promotion pretty much turned into wasted effort when Universal Entertainment decided to delay the film's release until September. Again, you can see much more about this in episodes 133 and 134. Late in 1978, ahead of the holidays, Celebration provided music for a commercial for The Handle, the new easy-to-use camera from Kodak. The commercials featured a pitch from Dick Van Dyke on the beach and a lyrical rewrite of Fun, Fun, Fun. She'll have fun, fun, fun with The Handle made by Kodak all day. It was performed by Celebration with a lead vocal by Mike Love. Which brings us to early 1979 and the release of the Celebration album. Before we talk about this album, I think it's important to spend just a few minutes getting in mind what the musical landscape of early 1979 was like. On February 21st, 1979, on the day this album was released, the number one album in the country was Blondes Have More Fun by Rod Stewart. Rod also was in the second of four eventual weeks at number one on the singles chart with Do You Think I'm Sexy from this album. And number two was Briefcase Full of Blues by the Blues Brothers, popular from John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd's appearances as Jake and Elwood Blues on Saturday Night Live. Their single Soul Man was at its number 14 peak. At number three, Cruisin' by The Village People. The album was, of course, propelled by their big hit, YMCA, which was currently in the last of its three weeks at its number two peak. The Bee Gees' brand new album, Spirits Having Flown, had just entered the charts at number four in its first week of release. This will go to number one for five weeks beginning March 3rd, then return to the number one spot for a week beginning April 21st. In the number five spot was Billy Joel's 52nd Street, following up his breakthrough album, The Stranger. At number six was Se Chic by Chic, featuring their number one smash, La Freak. La Freak had been number one for two non-consecutive weeks in December 78, and for another three weeks in January. It was currently at number seven. I Want Your Love from this album will go to number seven later in the spring. In the number seven position, was a new band with a unique new sound, Dire Straits. Their song, Sultans of Swing, will reach number four on the singles chart in April. And hot off her appearance in Greece, Olivia Newton-John was back with a new, sexier image. Her single, A Little More Love, hit its number three peak this week. The follow-up, Deeper Than the Night, will go to number 11 in June. At number nine was Toto, another new group on the charts. Their single Hold the Line had gone to number five for two weeks in January. And at number 10 was Eric Clapton with Backless, following up his hit album Slow Hand. The single Promises reached number nine on January 20th, 1979. Top 10 singles that we haven't talked about already were at number four, Fire by the Pointer Sisters, written by Bruce Springsteen and featuring one of the greatest pauses ever on a record. At number five, I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor, one of disco's all-time greatest hits. At number six, Every One's a Winner by Hot Chocolate. Number eight was Lot of Love by Nicolette Larson, written by Neil Young. Number nine was Barry Manilow's Somewhere in the Night. And at number 10 was Leif Garrett with I Was Made for Dancing. Disco was at, or at least very near, the peak of its popularity when the Celebration album was released. In fact, the Beach Boys themselves had released a disco single, Here Comes the Night, just a week earlier. Three weeks and two days later, the Light album will be released. New Wave was bubbling under and beginning to make some minor inroads into the charts. Old favorites like Clapton and newer mainstream rock acts like Billy Joel were holding strong, and it was into this fray that the Celebration album was released February 21st, 1979 on Michael Nesmith's Pacific Arts label. I've always thought the Celebration album cover was particularly poor, amateurish, and uninviting. There's no central image, nothing to focus on. At best, it's this photo of Mike, which seems unlikely to make anybody go, cool, I gotta hear this. Mainly, the collage minimizes the impact of any one image, using both candid and posed photos, color and black and white, and press clippings, it looks flat and scattershot like pages from a poorly composed scrapbook. Some of the headshots look like they put on their stage outfits and dropped by picture day at a junior high somewhere. 
It does include a lot of images and information that would make a very nice inner sleeve or back cover, but as an outer cover, it's hard to imagine anything less aesthetically pleasing or easier to overlook. Besides the aesthetics, the images on this album cover misrepresent what the album is. Apart from the headshots, everything here is from Celebration's USC show 10 months earlier. You'd be forgiven for expecting that the album inside this sleeve would be from that show. If this had been a live album, at least the cover would have made sense. As it is, it's as confusing as it is unappealing. Beach Boy fans could also fault it for featuring Brian and Carl Wilson, and Jan and Dean for that matter, on the cover of an album they don't appear on. Though as poorly laid out as the cover is, I doubt anybody ever noticed. Thematically, the cover is sort of a throwback to the early 60s in albums like Bruce Johnston's Surfer's Pajama Party. This, at least, was purportedly recorded live at the Sigma Phi Fraternity House at UCLA, across town from USC. The early 60s in general, and fraternities in particular, were a hot item early in 1979 due to the huge success of National Lampoon's Animal House, which had been released in the summer of 78 and was still packing them in at a lot of theaters. Of course, the rest of the entertainment industry took notice. By February 1979, all three television networks had rushed out fraternity sitcoms. ABC had Delta House, which was the official National Lampoon sanctioned TV series version of the movie, and even had a few of the movie's actors reprising their roles. It was probably the best of the bunch, which wasn't saying much. NBC had Brothers and Sisters about the hilarious misadventures of misfit fraternity Pi Nu and the women of Gamma Iota sorority at Larry Crandall College. Both series premiered within a few days of each other in January and would be canceled within a few weeks of each other in April. CBS's version was Co-Ed Fever, about the zany antics of an all-female college going co-ed. It was canceled after only one episode, which was broadcast on February 4th, 1979. I happened to catch that show that night and actually called up my friend Frank and told him to turn it on. Even by the standards of late 70s sitcoms, it was so bad it had to be seen to be believed. I think the decision to feature Celebration's Alpha Chi gig so heavily on the cover is, in part, an attempt to capture that Animal House wave. I imagine the band also had very fond memories of this day, and maybe they thought it really represented the spirit of what they wanted to be. But for me, this misses both aesthetically and thematically. As for the music on this album, we'll discuss that next time. Sorry we didn't get a little further this week, but I did think the background and cultural context were important, particularly in assessing this album. And that's just what we'll do next time. Meanwhile, I look forward to your comments on this. Please hit like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time when we will continue and talk about the music on the Celebration album. Have a good week. Bye.